just pick up and say what I've been saying now for nearly two weeks. Come at it from still another direction and speak to you from the 14th chapter of the book of Romans at verse 9. Romans chapter 14 and verse 9. And while you're turning to that, we quote from the last chapter of the book of Matthew, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. I want to speak to you tonight on the question of authority. And we read in the ninth verse of the 14th chapter of Romans, the purpose of the death of Christ and of his resurrection, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. The purpose that the Lord Jesus Christ had in mind to accomplish by dying and being raised from the dead was to earn the right to be the Lord of all mankind. All authority is given unto me, said this one, who died and God raised him and gave him all authority. It is a solemn thing to remember that Almighty God requires of you that you believe that he manifest in the flesh, was born in a cow stable in the little humble city of Bethlehem, and that you stayed in obscurity for almost 30 years and suddenly appeared upon the scene asking a man to baptize you and saying that you needed to be baptized for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness and that immediately after that baptism the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove and God parted the clouds of glory And earth heard God's voice, the Father's voice. This is the Son of my love in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And he walked the shores of God's earth for three or three and a half more years, went about ministering, doing good, raising the dead, healing the sick, and proclaiming, I'm here, the kingdom of God is here that he wound up in the hands of sinful men and they took him and nailed him to a tree on Golgotha's hill, that he was buried in other men's clothing and his body was perfumed by spices provided for other people, that he was buried in another man's tomb and the Roman government set guards there having sealed the tomb and that as far as this world knows his body If we could find it, we could dig long enough, we'd find a little handful of dust over yonder on Golgotha's hill, somewhere outside the city of Jerusalem, and uh, there would be all that remains of this one called Jesus. For no human eye has ever seen the Son of God since they put his body in a tomb. And as far as this world acts and lives and walks, there was a man by the name of Jesus who lived and made some claims and got what is coming to him by being crucified on a cross and buried in another man's grave. And that's the last of him. Ladies and gentlemen, God demands that you believe that that person was God manifest in the flesh that he is the Savior who for us men died on a cross to bring us into saving relationship to God. And God put all his eggs in one basket, and God requires you 
to believe his testimony against everything that the world has to offer and the penalty for not acting on God's testimony is eternal hell. That's some requirement. That's some requirement. I don't blame you for going to hell. If you don't get the wax out of your ears and sit up and take notice and begin to do what God Almighty tells you to do, you're going to land in hell because what God asks men to believe is absolutely the silliest thing I ever heard of or it is the God's truth. Take it or leave it. God demands that Ralph Barnard so believe the testimony he's given as to who that baby was, as to who that person that hung on a tree is, as to who that one they put in another man's grave. And he asked us to believe on the testimony of this book that he raised him, he, God, raised that one from the grave and exalted him and made him L-O-R-D, Lord, absolute dictator and despot over every human being who ever lived from Adam down to the last man. And you look me in the eye and tell me that you are waiting for God to do something else And I look down and tell you that he holds your feet to the fire of believing his testimony. And if you can't or you won't, at any rate, if you don't, God's got nothing for you but judgment and wrath. Now, if I thought up a wild story like that, you'd run me out of town. But I've given you the story of the word. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Listen. Listen. That baby will soon be singing Christmas carols. That baby, that person whom the religious people of his day looked over carefully and decided he wouldn't do and nailed to a cross. That person, God demands that you give him all the allegiance of your heart, all of the devotion of your soul, and all of the obedience of your will for the final verdict on your life and mine will be declared by that man, a man in glory, into whose hands Almighty God has turned over everything the devil, his angels, and you, and everything else. I'm telling you, that's some demand. I'm telling you no wonder that nobody ever gets saved that doesn't roll up his sleeves and spit on his hands and violently assault the fortress of the kingdom of God. Apart from God, God's Holy Spirit, awakening faith in you as you hear faithfully his word, no human being could possibly believe and believing do what God Almighty says you must do or go to hell. My Lord Jesus Christ tells us that he died and was raised from the dead in order that he, not somebody else, that he might be Lord, not you, not me, but he, in order that he might be Lord. There is absolutely no salvation for any human being except under the rule of Christ who holds in his hands the gift 
of eternal life, which is the gift of himself. If the Jewish nation had received the king, they would have found salvation under the rule of their king. And if you will bow to the Lordship of Christ now, you'll find salvation under his rule, for he is Lord because he's Savior. And in that sense, don't you folks now get too deep in theology, in that sense, he's the Savior of all men as well as being the Lord of all men. He's your Lord because he bought you. He's your Lord because he owns you. He's your Lord because he died on the cross for you. Because he is Savior, he is Lord. And his Saviorship is found inside of his Lordship. And you can believe all the brethren tell you and all of the facts that you want to believe. But you'll never know what it is to have the peace of God that passes understanding until you do for the Lord what the Jews refused to do for the king. Bow down and receive him. Submit to him as your Lord. And in submission to him, you find peace and you find what we call salvation. I want to ask you tonight whether the question of authority has been settled in your life agreeably to Almighty God. It's such a solemn thought, I know I'm not capable of preaching it or presenting it like it ought to be. But God Almighty won't accept anything except perfect agreement with him about who Jesus is and about what has been turned over to Jesus because of his blessed death on the cross. Hear me now. Professing Christianity is becoming rotten to the core because men and women inside and out from pulpit and pew Refuse to agree with Almighty God about what he has declared Jesus Christ to be. The question of authority. Every kingdom has to have a king. Every home has to have a head. Every church has to have a head. That awful lie about a church being a democratic body and governed by the majority vote of the people was hatched in hell. The church is not a democratic body. The church is a group of people who have a head and they're the subjects and that head is the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the splits and all of the hell and all of the corruption in our organized churches today can be traced directly back to the fact that this generation of church people, by and large, refuse to be under subjection to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. There's just one person's ever been given the right to run a church, and that's the Lord. Jesus Christ. There's just one person who's ever been given the right to run this world, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's just one person that's ever been given both the right and the authority to run your life and mine, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been given that right he's been given that right and unless you are in agreement with God on that you are silly to call yourself a Christian 
this hell raising, authority rejecting, every man doing that which is right in his own sight type of so-called Christianity is blatant rebellion against God Almighty testimony that Jesus Christ, his well-beloved Son, is Lord over every human being, both saved and damned. For it takes the Lord to save a man, and it takes the Lord to damn a man. save them or damn them one or the other no other person's got the power to save a sinner and no other person got the power to damn a sinner no sinner saves himself and no sinner damns himself Jesus saves and Jesus damns and as your Lord he'll save you or as your Lord He'll damn you. That's the testimony of the Word of God. Jesus Christ didn't die so much to be your Savior. He died to be your Lord. And as your Lord, He is the Savior. But this Bible I hold before me knows nothing about a Savior except the Lord Jesus Christ. 520 times in the New Testament. This one is called Lord. 28 times in the New Testament. <clears throat> He's called Savior. Eight of those times it's referring to the Father. 520 times in the New Testament. This one who was born in a cow stable and wound up on a Roman cross is declared by the Holy Spirit to be Lord. Twenty times exactly in the entire New Testament he's called Savior. The evidence is in the favor of his Lordship. Five times in the New Testament the words Lord and Savior occur together in the same verse of Scripture. In each one of these five occurrences where the term Lord and Savior occur in the New Testament, he's called Lord first and second and Savior second. For ladies and gentlemen, I guess we will go on the hill and never believe it, but the only one under God shining sun who can save any sinner at all from the penalty of his sin and take him to glory is the one God is set to be Lord over all mankind. The Lord is the Savior. The Lord. Peace on earth and goodwill to men came in output of the angels. For this day is born a Savior. Who is the Savior? Who is Jesus Christ the Lord? The Savior is the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. Jesus died that he might be Lord. He is Lord for three reasons. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord. By God's decree... He is not your Lord by you accepting him. He is not your Lord because you receive him. He is not your Lord because you consent to his Lordship. He is your Lord whether you consent to it or not. He is your Lord whether you bow to him or not. He is your Lord whether you accept him or not. He is your Lord, whether you believe in him or not. 
Jesus Christ is your Lord, and he is the Lord of every human being. In Psalms at chapter 2, I read these words, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree of the Lord that said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, ask of me, and I'll give you the whole outfit. I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the other most parts of the earth for thy possession. You run into scriptures about men denying the Lord who bought them. Don't try to explain it away. He did buy them. He bought lordship over them. He bought lordship over them. I think perhaps the most solemn thing I ever faced sinners with and I can't explain it. In most places it causes most no small stir. I quote from John's Gospel, chapter 17, the most solemn thing I ever tried to face. I sure hope I know a little bit about what it says. I can read you, quote what it says. I may not understand what it means. But if I can understand just a little what it means, if it means half of what it says, I think it's the most tremendous thing I ever faced sinners with. Here it is. As thou hast given him, he's talking to the Father. As thou hast given him, to him is the Lord. As thou hast given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. Where is eternal life? It's in the hands of this one to whom all authority has been given. It's in the hands of this one to whom every human being has been turned over. Ladies and gentlemen, it's in the hands of men and women. Jesus went to a bloody cross for, listen to me, as thou hast given him, 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 all this world don't believe it, but God turned everything over to his son. He's turned you over to his son. He's turned you over to his son. He's turned me over to his son. Oh, the son's going to pass a verdict on me and sit in judgment on me as thou hast given him authority over all flesh in order that having all authority he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's a solemn verse of Scripture. Whew. If that verse means half what looks like it means, I'm telling you the God's truth. It's time you came down off your high horse and humbled yourself in the sight of God and became a beggar in his sight. For salvation's in the hands of the living Son of God. Eternal life is not at the end of the acceptance of a proposition. Eternal life is the gift of a living Christ. That's solemn. That's solemn. Jesus Christ, the virgin born, so says the Bible. The crucified, so says the Bible. The risen, so says the Bible. The exalted, so says the Bible. The interceding, so says the Bible. The reigning, so says the Bible. The coming again to judge, so says the Bible. He's Lord. He's Lord. He's Lord. If you believe that, you'd do one, two things. You'd curse him, tell him going back to hell and leave you alone. That'd be consistent. 
or you'd become a beggar at his stone, Lord. If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. It is solemn that Jesus Christ is Ralph Barnard's Lord, whether I recognize him or not. He's Lord, despot. There are seven titles given my Lord in the book of the Revelation, every one of them carrying with it the meaning of absolute dictator. He is my absolute dictator. Who fixed him that way? Almighty God. Almighty God. The difference between a saved person and a person still on the road to damnation both of them have the same Lord. One of them is happy about it, and the other's not. What? What a decree from the reign of Christ. The other finds his freedom in the rule of Christ. What? is in the rule of Christ. And the other grits his teeth and tries to act like there was no Christ. What a wonderful thing to have your hand taken by a nail-pierced hand and lead you That's what salvation is. Jesus Christ is Lord by God's decree. Jesus Christ is Lord because he deserves to be Lord. I don't. You wouldn't mind me, would you? Not if you got in sin. You wouldn't follow me, would you? Not if you got in sin. There's one who deserves to be Lord. He's not a misfit, brother. He actually deserves throne rights in my life and yours. In that classic passage, do you know it by heart? I'll read it. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He did all that. He did all of that. He did all of that. What did he do that for? Romans 14, 9 says, so he could be your Lord. So he could be my Lord. And praise God, he is your Lord. And praise God, he's my Lord. And salvation is found in men who gladly receive the word. I sure am glad to have him as my Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He deserves to be Lord. And then he's Lord because he desires to be recognized by men and women. I know I can't handle it. It's a little too deep for me. But he was a man. Had to be a man to be my Savior and Lord. Had to be a kinsman redeemer. Had to be kin to me. 
or to redeem me. Isn't that right? He wasn't a blank machine or an adding machine. He was a man. He just like us, wasn't in all points except sin. Isn't that right, Scripture says? And as the man Christ Jesus, this is mystery. There was something set before him. The book of Hebrews says, Who for the joy that was set before him. I had to have him as my Lord. Praise. He deserves to be Lord. And then he, Lord, calls, he desires to be recognized by men and women. I know I can't handle it. It's a little too deep for me. But he was a man had to be a man to be my Savior and Lord. Had to be a kinsman redeemer. Had to be kin to me in order to redeem me. Isn't that right? He wasn't a blank machine or an adding machine. He was a man. He just like us, wasn't in all points except sin. Isn't that right, Scripture says? And as the man Christ Jesus, this is mystery. There was something set before him. The book of Hebrews says, Who for the joy that was set before him? Who for the joy that is set before him? There's some great goal of joy set before the man Christ Jesus. And he learned the part of the end of the rainbow, they call it. He kept his eyes on it. And the man Christ Jesus, he wasn't a ghost, he is a man. He's all God, but he's all man. Who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. I don't know whether I know how to interpret that or not, but I think here's what it means. I, I, I've studied the like passage in the book of Isaiah. And it sort of tears up some of my theology, but as soon as that gets torn up, the better off will be anyhow. Listen to me. Jesus Christ would like for you to recognize his lordship now. He'd rather save you than them. He was. Judgment is his strange work. He delighteth in mercy. He is rich in mercy. He's got the same gift for death. And the joy that was set before him was the perfect that made by the power of God would come up to know him and fall and he'd love him and he'd have a people to love and a people to whom who loved him. He wants to be loved. There never was a human being that didn't crave love in Jesus Christ was the one perfect human being that ever lived. 
thing about him, crying out for somebody to love. And somebody to love him. And come hell or high water, you want to have a people for his grace and praise his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace who love him. He desires to be your recognized Lord and Savior now. He'd rather save you. He and I won't get any joy out of damning you. Not a bit. Why, he says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But boy, he takes joy in his people. He'd he'd rather win your recognition of him now than to force it later, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. Ladies and gentlemen, to roll up your sleeves and willfully refuse him is to snatch from his lips the cup of joy which is set before him. What a wicked thing to do. He desires your recognition of his throne rights to your life. Now, it gives him joy. It gives him joy. What does his lordship by God's decree, what does his lordship by virtue of his death, what does his lordship by virtue of his desire imply? Three things quickly. Entire submission to it. Entire submission to Jesus Christ. That is a strange type of salvation that everybody brags about now, that knows nothing about daily choices and daily surrender and daily decisions and daily submission to the living Lord. That stuff they've called salvation that we prate about, that we see we received one time some time ago, and we got it up on a shelf if we ever need it, we'll pull it down. God help us. Nothing like that in the New Testament. The only type of salvation I'd find in the New Testament is the type when men actually meet a new master who's their savior who died for them, and hand in hand, the willing sinner is led by the living Lord to the desired haven. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lordship of Christ implies and demands entire Submission to Jesus Christ. The Lordship of Christ demands absolute ownership by Him of me and mine. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christians of the New Testament were described as people who first gave themselves unto the Lord. We've got a nice little stuff called Christianity now that affects our belief, but not ourselves. But in the New Testament, Christian people were people Paul could write about who first gave themselves. Amen. In the New Testament, Christian people, the people who are talked to in this language, ye are not your own. You have bought with a price. Isn't that right? Christian people in the New Testament were people who were possessed and were possessed of 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lordship of Christ involves unquestioning obedience. In that plaintive word, almost a sarcasm, the Lord Jesus says, Ralph, what do you hope to gain by calling me Lord, Lord? It's nice and orthodox and not doing the things which I say unto you. Brother, if there's anything on God's earth that'll keep a person coming to Christ for forgiveness and assurance, if there's anything on God's earth that'll never let a human being settle down on the leaves, if there's anything on earth that'll provoke can provide that honoring and thirsting and following out to the Lord Jesus. It is the claim of him to be the absolute dictator demanding utter submission, demanding that I am not my own anymore, demanding absolute obedience, absolute obedience to him to him, to nobody under God's shining sun but to him, to him. But he demands it. Why call you me Lord? Lord, you'll never graduate the way you can rest on your laurels there, brother. Why call you me Lord? Lord, and do not the things which I say unto you. I come for this solemn word of closing. The recognition of the Lordship of Christ is the act of you. You can either ignore him or recognize him. You can live in God's world as if you had the right to live your life. But God commands you. God commands you. God commands you to recognize His throne rights and to be glad in them and bow to them. And here's where we come to the one thing that break the heart of any hitchhiking preacher and any godly pastor. I look you in the face tonight, tell you you're living in a generation that's not paying one bit of attention to God's claims about his son. And I look you in the face and tell you tonight that the one thing that is more heartbreaking about this day than anything else is the fact that men just are not one bit interested in listening to this word. And since the only way on God's earth a sinner can be saved is by God awakening faith and repentance in him. And since the only way on earth he ever does that is as men faithfully listen to his word. This generation going to hell, brother, because God commands you to do what you never will nor can do apart from a faithful hearing of God's word. He came and no man can call Jesus Lord except in the Spirit. And the Spirit uses this word to bring the claims of God about his son and press them on men.
men and women. And everybody that ever gets paid are men and women who are feast with the claims of God about his son in this book. That's the way people get saved. Some of them bow to it. If it's true that no man can call Jesus Lord except in the Spirit, likewise it's true that every man can call him Lord in the Spirit. And the Spirit works in connection with a listen to this book. He's not flitting about the trees. He takes this book that's true whether anybody believes it or not. Sometimes the Spirit makes the book to live. And Jesus Christ leaps out of the pages of the book. And men gladly bow. And with Thomas say, My Lord and my God. I can't press the claims of God about his son on sinners very well but the Holy Spirit is in the world to do that and some of you has been doing that for a long time you've been hiding behind the doctrine or something and you're going to hide behind it and the trouble is chances are you'll be successful and go to hell There'll be a lot of orthodox Calvinists in hell because so many of them were clear on doctrine. They said, Lord, Lord. And that's orthodox, isn't it? Didn't we cast out demons and prophesy and do many wonderful works in your name? That's orthodox, isn't it? But they weren't acquainted with the Lord. He wasn't acquainted with them. But the Holy Ghost is not sent down here to damn men and women. He's sent down here to take the things of Christ, press them on men and women. That's the reason we pray for God to take his truth and press his truth not in the strength of a man but in the strength of the Holy Ghost face men and women with God's claim for his son he's your Lord he's your Lord you're going to bow to him now or then He's your Lord. He's your Lord. He's your Lord. During the First World War, a Red Cross nurse lay at the point of death, and she was attended by a sister nurse, Red Cross nurse, just a little while before the Red Cross nurse met death. She began to move her lips. She's almost gone. She began to say, bring, bring, bring. And the nurse attending her thought perhaps she wanted a sip of water, and she brought her some water. She shook her head. She didn't want any water. And she rested a little while, and directly she began to move her lips. Bring, bring, bring. And the attendant nurse thought she wanted God's book. She brought the Bible, but the dying woman shook her head. She didn't want the Bible. And after resting, getting some more strength, she began to say, Bring! Bring! And the attendant nurse, utterly nonplussed, brought her a pad, a paper, and a pencil. Thought perhaps she couldn't speak it out. She'd write out her request. She waved the head. She didn't want that. She rested a little bit and breathed as deep as she could and then slowly but surely on the palm of her hand she lifted the step to almost a sitting position in the bed and then with her last strength she began to say bring 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 
bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. God blesses the man or woman who will owe wicked soul. Right to his face and says, Lord, I'm in your hands. What wilt thou have me to do? That's where salvation is. For the sinner Surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm in your hands. What do you have me to do? Amen. 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 Our Father, in Jesus' name, we've tried in our bumbling way to present again what you've said about your son and what you demand of men about your son. We rejoice tonight that one day every knee shall bow to him one day every tongue confess and we further rejoice in the gospel of God's saving grace while the candle of God's long suffering and patience burns men are commanded to bow down to this appointed Lord and in his lordship find the salvation that he bought on Calvary's cross. We pray now that the Spirit of God, one more time, may press the claims of this marvelous Christ, God's Son, upon every human being here. For his name's sake we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing some song. You got one picked up. Number number eighteen.